Hey everyone, my name is Sean, and I want to take a moment to thank you for joining us online. We're going to worship together, read some scripture with one of our teaching pastors, and hear more about how our church is being a good neighbor in our community. We may be in San Diego, but if we're not in your area, we still have resources for you to check out. Make sure you subscribe to Garden Music on YouTube and our daily devotional podcast. Hey, let's church together.
Welcome back. Thanks again for joining us online. Make sure you follow us on social media and hit that subscribe button on YouTube so you can keep up with everything going on at the church. We believe there's no better way to start your morning off than in God's presence. But we know how easy it is for life to get in the way. That's why we created the Daily Devotional Podcast. Each day, we release a short episode to lead you in your time with the Lord. So text Daily Devotional to 97000 to get started. You can also listen to our band Garden Music and spend some time in worship at any time of the day. Find them on social media, YouTube, and your favorite streaming channels. Give them a listen today. If you're in our neighborhood, we want to invite you to in-person events like our men's and women's ministries, boardroom and greenhouse, as well as our weekly youth nights. If you're looking for a way to serve in our community, head over to our website to find available service projects so you can make a difference in your neighborhood. And lastly, we at the church want to thank you so much for your financial generosity. When you give to the ministry of the church at RB, you're giving to God's kingdom work and participating in bringing a little up there down here. Giving creates space for God to do something new in your heart. So if you're ready to take the next step in your generosity, visit us online at crb.gives. Hey, we're going to continue worshiping and then we will tune in live to the worship center for the message.
Well, good morning, 10 o'clock. How you doing? Good to see you. Hey, can we thank Ethan and the band? I just love these guys. I love the way they lead us. I love the... Yeah, absolutely. The way in which our music team here, uh, worship team, whatever the preferred nomenclature is, uh, I, I just love the way they pastor and shepherd us. And it's so beautiful and powerful. And uh, Hey, we, uh, we started a, a series together last week, a, a brand new series on the book of Mark uh, called Unbound, and uh, there's a couple reasons that we're doing this series. One is because we're 28 days away from Easter. Uh, did you know that? 28 days away from Easter. If you've not bought your Cadbury eggs, I'm sure there will be supply chain issues. You should do that. Uh, and it's just that time of year where we start to angle our head, our heart uh, towards resurrection, and I believe the world needs resurrection, don't you? Uh, and so we want to join in on the, the world uh, universally, the church universally, looking towards the empty tomb of Jesus and being the Easter people in a Good Friday kind of world. But there's another layer to this series, and it's that Mark uh, writes down, uh, he's the first one to do this, he writes down uh, who Jesus was because he didn't want people being confused as generations went on. Uh, it was common that people would start to make up versions or stories of Jesus, of who he was and what he did. And Mark and Matthew and Luke and John, uh, they write this down to make sure that nobody's fuzzy on the question of who Jesus is, why he came into this world. Uh, and we said this last week, your, your great temptation, my great temptation, is not that you would abandon Jesus, uh, that you, know, you just would give up your faith. Your temptation is you would create a Jesus who's palatable to you, who never challenges you, who never changes you. He he dislikes all the same people you dislike. Uh, he has your politics. He has, you know, your preferences. And he's not really Jesus. He's just you. He's some version of you that you made up. And Mark is, is keeping us honest to make sure that we, we don't do that, that we are actually true to who Jesus is. And, and I think my temptation as I uh, read through the scriptures is uh, it's not so much to, to create a Jesus as much as it is to cherry pick a Jesus from the scriptures that I like and to build my faith around a, a, a particular version that a gospel writer will give us. Uh, for instance, I, I, for me, I, I like that Jesus is a, uh, is a teacher, that he gives us all this wisdom and that we're supposed to follow it. Maybe for you, you like that part of Jesus. Uh, not even necessarily because we like doing everything he said. We like telling other people to do what he said to do. Uh, I'm preaching myself there. Uh, but we, we will ignore the fact that he came to be king. Uh, when it comes to him being king, which is what Mark tells us he came to do, uh, that's, a little, that's a little different. We like that he's a healer. We like that he's a forgiver. Maybe you have a, uh, a guilty conscience that continues to be your Achilles heel. And so you return to that image of Jesus again and again, and again uh, that he's a forgiver. And all those things are true, uh, but it's not necessarily the full picture of who Christ is and what he came to do. Uh, he, he came to be king to, uh, we're going to look at this uh, next week, to, to bind up the one who binds us up, the enemy, the dark forces, the, uh, Satan in this world who binds you and me up. He came to uh, to wage war against the dark forces of this world so you and I can live an unbound and free life and we can experience the power of God in our life. And uh, the invitation is not just for him to be your healer or forgiver. The invitation is for him to be your king. And Mark, uh, last week we looked at Mark chapter one. Uh, today uh, we're gonna look at Mark chapter... These are not trick questions, 10 o'clock. <laughs> We'll start with the basics. What time is it? Uh, next week, we'll look at Mark chapter... Three. Yes, and you don't want to miss next week. My friend Josh is going to be here with an incredible message on Mark chapter 3. And uh, the, the whole heart behind this series is he came to be king. He came to be king. And today, uh, he wants to be king of... And this is where the story goes. He wants to be king of the physical world. Uh, which is typically where we want him to show up. We want Jesus to display his power in our life in very visible ways. Uh, but Mark reminds us he came to be king first of the invisible world, the things that you cannot see. And here's the heart behind today. Uh, when you allow Christ, when you allow Jesus to be king of your invisible world, the areas of your life that nobody can see, he begins to demonstrate his power in your life in ways that everybody can see. Are you with me? And so I want us to look at this today. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Uh, I want to uh, look at uh, the end of Mark 1, which sets us up for Mark chapter 2. And uh, Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 23, is where uh, we are going to begin. How are we doing, 10 o'clock? 
You look strong. You look good. You look good. I forgot to say hey to those of you online. So good to see you online. Hope you are doing well. And uh, I usually say hi to my mom online, but my mom's not online today. My mom's actually in the building, which is cool. So, yeah. I'm so sorry I did that to you, mom. I know you, you're never going to speak to me again. Uh, so... There you go. I just got thrown out of the will. Anyway, Mark chapter, <laughs> Mark chapter 1, starting in verse, uh, verse 23. Uh, so we looked at last week, Jesus commands his followers to follow him. And he literally meant follow. He didn't mean go learn the word follow and understand what the word follow. He just physically follow me. That's what he wants you to do as king. I want you to, to live and obey uh, the words that I give you to live. Love your enemies. This is what he means. Just go love your enemies. Uh, and Mark tells you something very interesting at the outset. Nobody really understands what Jesus came to do. His followers, uh, they're confused and fuzzy on the question of his identity. Uh, who is this guy who has the power to heal? Uh, his family, uh, they think he's crazy. So if you've ever sat at a family dinner and everybody thought you were nuts, you're in good company. That's how Jesus' family felt about him. They tried to get him committed in Mark 3 because they're, they're, he's lost his mind. He's insane. Uh, but Mark tells you something interesting at the outset that uh, actually the demons, the demonic forces of the world, uh, they know exactly who Jesus is. And this is a very interesting way to begin a story about Jesus. Uh, verse 23, just then a man in their synagogue who had, uh, was possessed by an impure spirit or a demon cried out, uh, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? The demon says, uh, have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Uh, be quiet, Je uh, said Jesus sternly. Uh, come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. So it's a, a unique way to begin this story about Jesus. Uh, his family's fuzzy on the question of who Jesus is. His followers are fuzzy on the question of who Jesus is. The Pharisees don't quite understand who he is. The demons know exactly who he is. Now, why does that matter? Because often when you ask people, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a person of faith? Uh, we will quickly give neck up uh, explanations. Uh, it means you believe. It means you agree. Jesus is the son of God. It means you understand he came into this world to forgive you of your sins. And somewhere along the way, uh, maybe for you, you were 15, you were in your 30s. Somebody explained that to you. You checked a series of boxes on a card. Uh, you believed it. You agree with it. Uh, well, apparently, even the demons have really good theology. And if the goal of your faith is just to be right, if the goal of your faith is just to have good theology and understand who Jesus is, not that you shouldn't do that, but if that's the end goal, uh, well, apparently, uh, that just puts you in company with the demons. Uh, apparently, faith is something else. Somewhere along the way, we began to explain or understand faith, and I think you go back in Christian church history, and somewhere in the 300s, the 400s, all these creeds and councils began to be organized and written down, and they would say, hey, this is what it means to be a Christian. Uh, you have the Nicene Creed, you have the Apostles' Creed, around the year 400 start to be written down, and Christians would say, this is what it means to be us, and it's a series of statements, and some of you, if you grew up Catholic, or you grew up in high church settings, and we even sing these songs here that, that articulate this, and they're powerful. Uh, I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the resurrection. I believe in the saints' communion. And, and Mark's point, we're going to get to this, is not so much do you believe those things, but do you now live in a world where those things are possible? That you would live in a world that would say, uh, if a virgin birth is possible, well, what else is possible in my life in 2022? If a resurrection is possible, if dead guys can walk out of tombs, then what else is possible in my office? What else is possible in my family right now? What, what kind of resurrection could I experience? Uh, Mark wants you to know that God has a dynamic relationship with this world. The membrane between heaven and earth is quite thin, and he wants to bust through it regularly. And he wants to be engaged in your life. He wants to, uh, to, to be involved in your life. And faith isn't so much just agreeing that that's true, but waking up every morning and saying and seeing how can that begin to be lived out in my world, not just setting uh, some propositional truths in your brain the right way. And so the question for Mark is, if faith's not just believing, because even the demons do that, 
uh, what actually is it? And Mark's going to tell you in Mark chapter 2. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me or you can follow along on the screens or the Church at RB app is a great place uh, to follow along as well. A few days later, it says Jesus again entered Capernaum, a town next to Nazareth. And it says the people heard that he had come home. And so he had been traveling in uh, the northern uh, Israel, uh, teaching, healing, word was spreading, and he comes home. And it says they gathered in such large numbers. So here he is in a house, and there's a large crowd of people. And this would go on for several hours. uh, And there was no room left, not even outside the door, as he preached the word to him. And so Jesus, Mark tells you, uh, is a teacher with authority. He's, He's healing, he's teaching, he's offering fresh interpretations of the Hebrew scriptures. People are gathering to hear him. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man, you've probably heard this story before, carried by four of them. And so four friends bring their paralyzed friend to this particular house where Jesus is. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above uh, Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. I love this story. Have you heard this story before? This is the best story ever. Uh, I love these guys already. They're not patient. Uh, They don't want to wait in the healing line. Uh, They see an opportunity. Uh, Let's go on the roof. And Jesus, he would be in this house for several hours, and these guys start digging away at the roof. And, you know, we kind of think of it as, you know, 2,000 years ago, they probably just pulled a little hay back, took five minutes. Uh, No, you you don't just unroof a roof, Uh, it takes some time. Uh, I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. My dad had a roofing company for a while, and my, p- part of my job in the summers was to, uh, to do the tear-offs on the roof in Atlanta summers, and that was not a fun job. That's why I became a preacher. And <laughs> you would look down, your knuckles would be bloody with tar. Unroofing a roof is actually quite difficult, and the same would be true 2,000 years ago. It would be clay and, uh, and hay and brush and all kinds of things that would have been molded together. Uh, so these guys, these four friends, they are bloody knuckled. They are digging and digging and digging, and they finally get to the, the like base of the roof. They pull it off. This would take several hours. So you get a picture of the scene. There's Jesus in the house teaching. You got a large crowd. They're watching dust just kind of fall and shake from the ceiling. And all of a sudden, a few hours later, after the roof has been unroofed, here comes the paralyzed man. And he falls down onto the floor on his mat. And it says, there he is. And Jesus, verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, and I've read this a hundred times, and I just noticed it this week. I love this. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Does that strike anybody else as weird? So you can't walk. You've never been able to walk. Your four friends are quite aware that you can't walk. You hear a rumor about a guy who turns water into wine is somewhere in proximity to you. You dig for hours to get to this guy. They throw you down in front of him. There you are. There he is. And he looks at you in your paralyzed state and he says, your sins are forgiven. If you're paralyzed, is this what you came for? (laughs) No, you know his friends have to be like, Jesus, it's his legs, man, it's the the, the walk thing, he can't walk, like, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but you're Jesus, you should obviously see, Uh, why in the world would Jesus heal the man's heart, forgive his sins before he actually physically heals him. Why is he demonstrating power over the invisible world before he demonstrates it over the physical? Why is he king over the invisible before he's king over the physical? Uh, Now, at another level, he says something pretty interesting here. It says, when Jesus, what? When Jesus saw their faith. So, in Mark chapter 1, he tells you faith isn't just something you believe. It's not just some uh, quiet confidence you carry around. Oh, you know John, he has such faith. He never talks about it. Nobody really, you know, sees him do anything good for anybody. But man, he wakes up in the morning and he prays for a little while. And he's got this quiet confidence that goes around in his head and his heart in sort of this stoic way. No, for Jesus, faith isn't something you just believe. It's not something you agree with. It's something you, you see it. And that's the power of this. He says, when Jesus saw their faith, 
And as moms, as dads, as business leaders, as church leaders, as people in the city, the question is not just do you carry around the quiet confidence in your heart to say, I believe in Jesus. Yes, I do. How about you? Uh, but that you, you actually have a demonstrative faith where people could point to it and say, I, I see it. In this man's case, it's his desperation. And I think that's true in our case, uh, that at some point in your life, faith has to be a desperate act where you would tear the roof off of a house just to get to Jesus. And I don't care how long you've been a Christian. I don't care how much Bible you know. Uh, is there still a desperation to experience Jesus in a physical way where people see you, where your kids see you, uh, getting in the car in the morning, where uh, you talk to people about faith, where they can see it, where, it's, where there's a desperation in your heart and in your head uh, for, for Jesus, where, where you're actually wanting to experience him in your life in a powerful way. Uh, it's something you see. It's not just something you agree with. It's, it's both, but it's, it's got to be seen. James says this in James chapter 2, the brother of Jesus. Uh, he says, you believe there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. He says, faith without works is dead in James 2. You got to see it. Where does it take place? And for this guy, it's in his desperation. That might be you today. It might be in your desperation just to be here. It might be in your marriage, you're desperate for God to do something. And I think that's true for all of us at a certain level. We all have some pain point that brings us to church. And it's the question, why does he heal the man in his heart, forgive him before he physically heals him with the thing that actually is afflicting him? I think this is how it always works. We have some pain point in our life that draws us into faith. That we know I need Jesus in this area. For you, it might be your, your finances. Maybe you, uh, you started coming to church because your finances were in ruin and your friends, you know, they lowered you in the church building on a Dave Ramsey mat, <laughs> paid for in cash. Uh, and that was your pain point. And, and so that was how you began to experience Jesus. Maybe for you it was marriage. You, you needed marriage counseling somewhere along the way. And you thought, I don't know about faith, Jesus, but I don't want to lose my family. And so you began to ask Jesus to do something about your pain point. We all come to Jesus this way. Uh, myself included. Uh, my pain point, I have three boys, five, eight, and ten. And my pain point in life is I'm terrified of raising them in a world where uh, they're not in church. I'm just being honest with you. That's why I come every week. <laughs> I mean, you thought I was here because I'm on staff. No, I'm here because I got to get my kids here uh, to be around you, to be quite honest. I, I, I don't want them just to be in my home hearing me say it. I want them to be in a community of faith where they're watching you live it out. And they're experiencing faith in the community. That's my pain point. Uh, I lower them through the roof every week around here. Uh, we, I, I want them to experience something. Uh, we all come to faith with some pain point. Uh, but, but you notice what Jesus does. He does the same thing with you. That's what draws you in. But he, he draws you in to forgive you. And to reconcile, reconcile and restore your, your broken relationship with God and to forgive you, which is strange because you would say today, I don't need that. Let's talk about the pain. Let's talk about the fact that I, I, in this area, I'm lying on a mat. And Jesus says, no, you need, you need forgiveness. If we had lunch today and I said, you know what your problem is? Uh, <laughs> uh, you need forgiveness. You, you would say, I got a thousand problems. That's not one of them. I got financial problems, I got marriage problems, I got kid problems, I got job problems, I got boss problems. I do not have a forgiveness problem. To which Jesus, the great physician, would say, yes, you do. If he doesn't forgive this guy, if he doesn't, if he doesn't set right in the invisible kingdom, his broken relationship with God, the creator of the world, if, if, if this man doesn't experience forgiveness from God, he can heal him. He's just gonna get sick somewhere else. And the same is true for you. The same is true for me. Uh, you can come to faith and get your financial world in order. Uh, you can get some parenting tips. You can come to, to church and uh, get some marriage counseling and patch things up, get things looking a little bit better. But if you don't experience the power of the forgiveness of God in life, you're just going to get sick again somewhere else. And you get drawn in because of the pain point. 
but it's the forgiveness God really wants to grant you. You go, I, I don't need that. I, I haven't offended God. You know, God sinned against me or other people have caused me great pain. They need forgiveness. Uh, listen, if you, in, in your marriage, take that as an example. If you, uh, if you come to faith because you, you, you need marriage counsel, you need help, and you get better, things are, are fine, but you don't experience the forgiveness of God, eventually your husband, your wife, uh, they're gonna offend you again. I know it's shocking. And when they do, if you haven't experienced the forgiveness of God, you're not going to be able to forgive them because you cannot give away what you've not received. Uh, you have to experience forgiveness. You have to, uh, in the invisible kingdom of God, uh, experience the power of God forgiving you to which we all go, I don't need that. That's not what I need. Uh, Jesus says, yes, you do. Uh, because that, if, if you don't experience that, you get sick somewhere else. And as we move towards Easter, I would just ask you the question today. Uh, there might be some very obvious pain points in your life that you see, that everybody sees, and people say, you need to do something about that. Uh, but if you have not done something about your broken relationship with God and the lack of forgiveness uh, in, in your own heart, and you've never felt the forgiveness of God in your life, uh, y- you need to do that. Uh, don't leave today without experiencing that. Uh, because that, if you don't experience that, you get sick somewhere else. And I know for a lot of us, you say, well, that sounds so squishy. How do you define that? Uh, put that on an Excel spreadsheet for me. What does forgiveness look like? Even when you forgive a friend or you forgive somebody, what, how do you know? I mean, it's just this abstract idea. Uh, the best definition I've ever read of forgiveness uh, or how you know you've been forgiven. It, uh, it came from a, a British author, uh, Francis Spufford. He wrote a book several years ago called Unapologetic. And in it, he uh, surprisingly in his own life became a Christian. And he wrote this book as a defense of Christianity. And uh, he, he said this, and I, I've always loved this, this quote from Spufford. He said, uh, what does it feel like to feel yourself forgiven? He said, I can only speak for myself But speaking for myself, he says, it's surprising. In my experience, it's like a toothache stopping because a tooth has been removed. It has the numb surprisingness of something that hurt not being there anymore. And when you experience it, that's what it's like. Have you ever had a toothache before? Uh, I know I've had this and you, at first it comes on and you hope it goes away and it never does, does it? Uh, The dentist in the room, you understand that. It gets gets worse until you do something about it. And you can start to try to live with it, but it doesn't matter what you do, it shades every moment of your life. You could be at a five-star uh, restaurant in Maui overlooking the beach. If you have a toothache, that meal is going to be a, a little bit miserable, isn't it? Uh, it's just going to linger there. It's going to shade every moment. It's just uh, until you do something about it. And then when you actually finally, you know, stop chewing on the other side of the mouth, you stop trying to compensate around it, and you actually deal with it, you didn't realize how bad you needed it. And it's healing, you feel it, and all of a sudden it's surprising how good it feels. Uh, That's Spufford's point. That's what Jesus gives this man. And if you've never experienced that, the lack of forgiveness, it's shading all of your relationships, it's shading everything in your life right now. Uh, You've just learned to live with it, but Jesus doesn't want you to. Uh, He wants to offer it to you so like this guy, you you can experience the the, the power of God. He wants to be powerful in the area of your heart that nobody sees. Uh, another way to explain it, I have a, a five-year-old son, Ezra, and Ezra, uh, he, he always wears his shoes on the wrong foot. Uh, you'll probably see him later tripping his way through the atrium. Uh, but, and you can go to him and say, Ezra, buddy, your shoes are on the wrong foot. And he'll look at you deadpan and he'll say, they're not actually. Uh, and you, you <laughs> it's an ongoing conversation around, uh, Ezra, your shoes are on the wrong foot. They're, they're not actually. And he looks at all of you like you're crazy and you're wearing your shoes on the wrong foot. And he, he has this uh, unbelievable confidence. And he, uh, the same thing will happen over and over again. Uh, he'll start to run and his shoes are on the wrong foot and he'll fall flat on his face and he'll come back to you and say, Ezra, uh, here's the deal, buddy. You got to put your shoes on the right foot. They're on the wrong foot. And be like, they're not actually. And he's crying. Uh, and then he'll run again and he'll fall on his face. And I'll say, buddy, your shoes are on the wrong foot. They're not actually. And he'll run. Uh, that's the picture here. God comes to you, comes to me somewhere along the way. 
and he'll say, hey, you need forgiveness. And here we are in our life, we fall fallen flat on our face in every possible area, and God's standing over you going, you need forgiveness. And we're looking at him going, I don't actually. <laughs> I'm just going to keep tripping and falling flat on my face in all these other areas of life. Listen, you need forgiveness. Uh, you've learned to live with your shoes on the wrong foot for so long, you don't recognize it. But when you experience it, you go, this is way easier. Uh, that's what God wants to grant for you. That's what he's doing for this man. He's, I, before I physically heal him, I'm going to heal his heart. I'm the king of the invisible world. And before I demonstrate my power in the physical world, where everybody's going to see it, I'm going to do something here that nobody's going to see. I'm going to do something that uh, it, on, on the inside, in the invisible kingdom, I, I'm, I'm the God of the, of the places nobody sees. And so this guy is, uh, is told this, that he's healed, which is odd. He doesn't even ask for forgiveness, but he gets it. And it says, uh, when Jesus saw his faith, he, he's forgiven the man. He says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then in verse six, it says, now some teachers of the law were sitting there uh, this is, the teachers are always a fun group, the, the Pharisees. Uh, they're thinking to themselves, why does this fella talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they have a point. Uh, uh, only God can, can forgive sins. And oftentimes, uh, you have friends, you have coworkers who'll say things like, well, Jesus is a good teacher, but he's not God. And one of the, the arguments people often give is, uh, he never claimed to be God. Uh, people will always uh, will often say that to you. He never, he never said he was God. He just, you know, he's a good teacher. Uh, I would argue he claims to be God on every page of the New Testament, uh, but specifically in this passage, when he forgives sins, he's claiming to be God. Uh, if Frank and Jim were on the back wall today and I walked up and punched Frank in the nose and Jim looked at me and said, Jared, I want you to know Frank forgives you for that. Uh, Jim can't do that. Only Frank can grant forgiveness when he's been offended. And the same is true for God. God grants the forgiveness because when you sin, you have, you have sinned against God. And so when he's granting forgiveness, he's saying, uh, I'm the God of the invisible kingdom. And he's about to demonstrate his power in a very visible way. And he says this in, in Mark chapter 8. Immediately, I love this about Jesus. Jesus knew in his spirit uh, that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? What is easier? And Jesus, he tells him a riddle. Uh, what's easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? Uh, well, the obvious answer is it's easier to say, you know, your sins are forgiven. You, nobody would even know. I mean, it's, it's, it's way harder to actually cause a guy to get up and walk. Uh, but for Jesus, he's saying, no, it's harder to be God and actually grant forgiveness. But I want you to know that the Son of Man, and here, here he is claiming to be God, uh, has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And they were challenging whether or not, they weren't challenging whether he had the power to heal the guy. They were challenging whether or not he was God. And here he says, I'm going to demonstrate for you in a very visible way that I'm the God of the things that you can see. Uh, but I, I've also demonstrated I'm the God of the things you cannot see. And I'm gonna basically do in the visible world what I just did in the invisible world, uh, that, that I'm the king of both. And, and I'm going to show you by this man walking uh, the authority I have over the invisible realms to grant forgiveness, to bind up demons, uh, to heal the sick. I, I'm gonna show you in a very physical, visible way uh, what I can do in an invisible way. And so he heals the guy and he tells the guy to get up. And this is the power of verse 12. It says, he got up, this guy, he takes his mat, he walked out in full view of them all. And you know his friends who brought him there, like finally, he got around to the healing. Uh, this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. I, I love that. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want your friends that grew up with you? Don't you want uh, your family to see in your life that you've experienced the power of God in such a visible way that they say, we've never seen anything like this. I can't believe Jojo is this, that's the same Jojo. You know, I mean, it's incredible what's happening in her heart, what, who she is. Uh, we've never seen anything like this. And, and Mark here, he's doing something interesting. If you read the passage uh, three times, he uses this phrase, get up. He, get up uh, he tells the man, get up. The man got up. And Mark, 
he, all the writers of the Gospels are brilliant, but he is especially crafty and he buries little Easter eggs in his story. I don't, no pun intended. Uh, but he is hiding something in this and he uses this, uh, this phrase, get up, three times. And that word that he uses there for get up is this little Greek word and the only other place he uses it is in Mark 16 when he's referencing in verse 6 that Jesus Christ himself got up from the dead. And he's, he's telling his story in such a way that he's, he's connecting chapter 3 with chapter 16 to say, Jesus Christ got up from the dead so that this man could get up from his mat and walk. Jesus Christ experienced a resurrection so that this man would experience a resurrection. Uh, and he's telling not just the audience then, but he's telling us, uh, Jesus Christ experienced a resurrection so that you could experience a resurrection. Uh, Jesus Christ got up from the dead so that you in your life would get up from some mat that you're lying on. And you would begin to experience the power of God in a way that people would be amazed to say, look at what God's doing in his head. Look at what God's doing in her heart. Look at what God's doing in their life, in their family, in their marriage. Uh, he got up so, so people could see you get up. That's the power of the story. It's not just to check a box and say, I agree, he got up from the dead. It's so that in our lives, we would continually be new creation, getting up from whatever is binding us, whatever area of our life is, is keeping us paralyzed on the mat. He wants people to see a, a visible resurrection in your life where you say, look, she's getting up. He got up, she, she's getting up. And you go, well, how, how does that work? Well, today you have some pain point in your life. I imagine it's a pain point that people can see. Uh, it could be in terms of your marriage. It could be in terms of your relationship with your kids. It could be in terms of your finances. There's some area where uh, you've been lowered through the roof. And you're probably praying and thinking along those lines, God, do something here in this visible, physical way. And you and I begin to experience the power of Christ in visible ways when we start to grant him access to be the king of our invisible world. And you want to experience Christ in a physical way? You want to experience Christ in a visible way where people say, I'm amazed at what God's doing? You start allowing him to be Jesus Christ in the areas of your heart that nobody sees. He'll start to demonstrate his power in your life in a way that everybody's going to see. Uh, you start letting him be king of that, that thing, that area, that secret, that, that habit that nobody sees. He'll start demonstrating his power in ways that everybody sees. You start experiencing his forgiveness, his grace, his mercy, his patience in ways that nobody sees. He'll start demonstrating his power in ways that everybody sees. There's some power when we start to organize our private world where it gets demonstrated in our life in very public ways, where all of a sudden God can demonstrate his power in very public ways in our life. I, I'm always amazed when I meet people who'll say things like, you know, uh, for 20 years I was single and I wanted a husband, I wanted a wife, and I started going to church, I started praying, I started uh, seeking the forgiveness of God. And Five days later, I met my husband. You know, two months later, I met my wife. Uh, there's some power that happens and it, it gets unleashed in the, in the physical world when we start allowing Jesus Christ to be king of our invisible world. Uh, maybe as a father today, uh, you want a better relationship with your son. You want a better relationship with your daughter. That's your pain point. Uh, you want something for them. Uh, and, and I would imagine if you began to allow Jesus Christ to be king of your invisible life, uh, that, that Goliath that keeps slaying you, you allow Jesus Christ to step into the battlefield of your mind and allow him to slay that Goliath and you allow him to be king of that thing that nobody sees, it will have a generational effect in a way that everybody's gonna see. It will allow him to demonstrate his power in ways that everybody sees. Uh, but we have to come to him and experience his forgiveness. We have to come to him and experience his grace. We have to allow him first to be the king of the thing that nobody sees so he can begin to be the king in a way that everybody is gonna see. Don't you want that? The power of God on display in your life, unbound from what hinders you and holds you back. He says, give me the thing nobody sees. Uh, allow me to touch the place uh, the guilty conscience. Allow me to touch the, uh, the private habit. Allow me to be king of your mind. Allow me to be king of your heart. Uh, allow me to be in the, in the secret, in the quiet, in the moment where nobody sees. And I'll display my power through you in ways that everybody sees and everybody is amazed at what God's doing in your life. 
That's Mark. That's the power of this story. Let's pray together. I just uh, wonder this morning as we walk through this passage, maybe for you today, you need to experience the forgiveness of Christ. And for the first time in your life, you, you need to hear the voice of the Father say, your sins are forgiven. You've never heard that voice before. And if you want to receive the forgiveness of Christ and experience his power in your invisible, quiet heart, would you just raise a hand this morning? Just say, that's me. I want to experience the forgiveness of Christ. Maybe for the first time in your life, you just need that forgiveness to wash over you. So allow him to grant you peace today. Don't carry that around. If you pray that prayer, I, I, or if you want to pray a prayer with somebody just to experience that today, I invite you to come down front. Counselors will be down front. If you need that forgiveness, maybe for the first time in your life, you need salvation to spring up from the ground. Just ask you to, in confidence, step out today and say, hey, I, I need to talk to somebody. God, all across this room are men and women who need to be reminded you are the king of the invisible. Would we allow you to sit on your throne today? Would we allow you to be the God who reigns supreme over demons and principalities and authorities over the rulers of the air? Would we allow you to be the king over all the dark forces that hold us down? And would we ask you to take up your throne in the private so that it can be displayed in the public square that you are the God of our life. Would we be the kind of people today, moms, dads, fathers, business leaders, who start to organize our private world around your throne? Uh, no more secrets. Would we allow you to be the king of the invisible so you can become king in very visible ways? Would we get up because you got up King Jesus, would we call on your name today in the same way this man did to experience your power and your healing. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's children said, grace and peace.
Hey, thanks for churching with us today. We want you to know that we're here for you. If you want to connect with the pastor or counselor, please call the church at the number below. 
And don't forget to engage with our daily devotionals and worship throughout the week with Garden Music, wherever you like to stream. We'll see you next time. 